film this. <laughs> This is Torin, and we're turning this lifeboat into a liveaboard. Welcome back to our channel, or welcome if you're new. Uh, today what we're doing to our lifeboat is building our front deck, or frack. So here we are building a little bit of the frame. I think you've seen this in a previous episode. But the inside looks like this. So this is basically the underside or seat for our front deck. And what we need to do today is cut from the outside and build the structure from the outside in. So once we had built sort of a little bit of an interior structure, and don't worry, we have since built much more of a framework and used a lot more fiberglass than what you just saw, Torin came up and used a jigsaw to cut through the boat so that we could pull up what was that hatch and then kind of show off the um, seat which we had just made. We then covered that with plastic and it was a good thing we did because as some of you know we're in the Pacific Northwest and it rains all the time. So here you can see Torin getting her undressed again because it had clearly rained since the last time we were at the boat and nothing had been fiberglassed at this point so it was a little bit of a delicate operation. Once we were ready to start working again, Torin made a cardboard template. So this is for the backrest. It comes up a little bit proud of the height of the boat, not too high or we wouldn't be able to see while we were steering, but we want it to be nice and comfy, of course. So here Torin's using cardboard. We thought that would be the best way for us to figure out the compound curves. It's a little complicated. It's a curving backrest. It flares out a little bit, so it's a little bit wider at the top than it is at the bottom and the actual top edges are curved as well. So lots of things to figure out. You can see Torin there sketching his ideas. Also at some point, Torin did get a, a layer of fiberglass onto the bottom of this. So I don't think I have footage of that, but if you see it looking fiberglass, I know I just said it wasn't, but at some point we got some glass on there. So it was a little bit waterproof, but obviously still being careful until it was fully completed. Once we had that rough piece of cardboard ready to go, which I have to say, just as a side note, I have kept for the past year in the hopes of using it again when I'm making the cushions for the freck. So stay tuned to see the rattiest piece of cardboard you've ever seen in your life make an appearance in a future vlog. But anyway, once we had that, it was time for Torin to transfer the template to the Baltic birch and then to use a jigsaw to cut it out. We're using thin Baltic birch here. I believe it's eighth inch, it might be quarter inch, I can't remember. Um, we used it partially because it's nice and bendable. So we've laminated three sheets together, you'll see that in a minute. But in that way we were able to follow those curves and because we did lots of epoxying and fiberglassing, it's turned into one nice big solid waterproof sheet, but we are able to move it around and get that nice comfy curve that I talked about earlier. Plywood in hand, it was time to head up those stairs and see how it all fit together. And can I just take a second to say how much I appreciate having these rolling staircases in the yard. I'm not a big fan of ladders and these make it so much easier to work up there. So Torrens put in the first piece of plywood for the backrest of the freck. And I think two more pieces are going to get laminated in tomorrow. And this will be, I think, my favorite part of the boat for sure, where I can just come and read a book and hang out and relax and drink a coffee, look at the sunset. Very excited. In order to laminate the backrest together, we used three pieces of wood and thickened epoxy. So here Torrin's mixing together the thickened epoxy from West Systems. We've mixed lots of epoxy on this channel and we'll mix lots more. So I'm not gonna show you much here, but you can see that he's making up a regular batch of epoxy and then adding in some thickener. I think it's colloidal silicate or something along those lines, but the whole system works well together to give you a peanut butter consistency, which when slathered onto your wood, creates a really strong, long lasting and waterproof bond. Once 
once we had our peanut butter made, it was time to laminate the wood together. It was a simple process of putting the epoxy on the wood, spreading it out, and sticking everything together. Here we had laminated both pieces together and then it was time to take them up to the freck and attach it all to the boat. You can see that the wood is basically in place but since we don't have a million clamps in order to properly attach it together Torin put in a ton of these little tiny screws to hold it all together. Once the epoxy dried we were able to take them out and cover them up with fiberglass. That gave us all the, the strength and waterproofness without having a bunch of extra holes. Anytime you have a hole in fiberglass, of course, it's a potential ingress route. So we try to avoid that. So we traced the plywood onto the fiberglass, which I will cut out. And then Torrin's going to gloss it all in on the freck. So I'll spare you from having to watch it because I know we're bored of it, I'm sure you're bored of it, but there was more fiberglassing. So once we did attach those two pieces of glass I just cut out to the backrest, then Torin came up here with some fairing compound. This is a special two-part mixture that we get. You can also use epoxy with fairing compound, like a powder that you add, but we prefer to buy it in two parts, comes in two tubs, mixes together, it works super, super well. Anyway, however you get to that point, what you have here, again, is like a thickened epoxy product, and you use it to fill gaps and smooth edges, and like you can see here, Torin is taking that aggressive kind of 90 degree join and just sort of filling it out, again, waterproofing, strengthening, and making it look a lot better. This, of course, is a little bit out of order, but Another clip just to show you some other things we were working on at the same time. So starting to take that aggressive orange off in preparation for painting, you'll see what color we picked and then again what color we picked the second time around, so a story to come. But the next thing that we're going to work on in this episode anyway is our steering station. You might remember that when we sold the engine, we also sold the steering station right along with it partly because it didn't really fit with our aesthetic and it wasn't a very efficient use of space, especially taking a huge diesel out and replacing it with a much smaller electric motor. So we decided to rebuild our own and that's what we're about to start. When we cut the steering station out, of course, it wasn't done super precisely. So one of Torin's first jobs was to come in here with the little vibrating saw and cut the rest of the fiberglass out so that we had a nice flat level. I don't know if we've talked about it too much, but Luya has a huge build. You'll see that as we put our batteries in there and all sorts of things we're going to fill up because the number of gallons of water that would fit in there are frankly horrifying. So we're going to have a smaller bilge that's a little bit more reasonable for our needs. And in the meantime, our prop shaft is just to the bottom left in this. Um, you can't really see it, but kind of to orient you, that's where we are here in the aft of the boat. There you go, you can see the prop shaft now. Um, but yeah, we're gonna fill in some of this gap, build over it. That should all become more clear as we do more on the inside. But in the meantime, some cutting and some sanding coming up in a second. So Torin is sanding it, getting it smooth, and also making that nice surface so that when we are sick of flexing or gluing anything down, it's got lots to grab onto. Pretty self-explanatory. I will just say we love this dustless sanding system. It's amazing how much that vacuum pulls out of there, so we really have a nice experience when we're sanding inside and out, which is good because there's so much sanding to do, it's not the most fun. So anything we can do to make it better. From there, we just started construction. It's a pretty simple box, basically, so nothing too complicated. But like you can see, we're using wood, and it's nice and solid. 
I have to say to skip ahead to present time, we are helping my uncle look for a travel trailer and having a look at those, I know that weight is the most important thing for them, but even the really nice ones, they're just so light. I mean, they're literally made of paper. Um, lots of compressed paper going on there, really, really lightweight materials, and they just seem like in a stiff breeze they're going to topple over, which, again, lightweight, you really need that in a trailer, in a racing boat you would need that, uh, lots of boats, weight is a huge consideration. For us, we are so glad every single day that we are trying to add weight. Again, we're trying to replace the weight of 60 people so that Luya sits a little bit better in the water. So we have something like 11,000 pounds to get her to her sort of solace specified where she wants to be to sit in the water weight. We won't add that much. We're trying to find a balance between weight and stability and also, of course, efficiency, especially being an electric engine. But it is something that we think about all the time. It's so nice. We can use wood. We can use tile. We can just use those finishes that we like, but also really feel like she is a solid boat because, of course, her hull is very solid, tons of fiberglass in this boat, and it's really nice to be able to continue that through the inside. So you can see here Torrens using the pocket hole jig by Craig. We've talked about it before, but of course we really like this system. It's got these little angled holes that you pre-drill, then the screws go through there, and really handy for attaching bits and pieces together without having to make fancy angled joints or like dovetail them or anything like that. So for this kind of initial rough construction, Combined with some glue, it is really quick and solid and strong, and so we use an awful lot of it. I'm not going to bore you with too much of it, but you can see the construction going together here. Basically building the equivalent of studs for a very, very tiny house. In this case, what this will become is the electrical room. Where Torin is standing in the bilge is roughly where the engine will be mounted. Where his legs are is kind of the electrical room, and then his hips are roughly level with the top of these sticks. That's where the platform goes that our seat goes on. So when you're steering, you're actually raised up quite high in these boats. It gives you a really great view, somewhat separated from the main living area, but I think that will be okay. <laughs> um, it's not a big boat, so maybe having our own space isn't a bad thing. Later on, we will show you the platform and how this has since progressed. The last thing for this episode, though, is something that our patrons had a chance to check out, but for everybody else, we are going to talk about insulation. Uh, this little clip goes into more detail, but we are still planning to purchase this, haven't done so yet, but last summer when this video was filmed, we were doing all of our research, and some of that is here. We know that wool is really good with moisture, what we don't know is how good it is with salt water. So one of the things that we're really looking forward to doing with Luya is using natural materials wherever we can. And one of the first things we'll be putting in is this all natural insulation. It's Havelock wool, which is just as it sounds, wool and bats. It's pretty common in Europe and the US, but not so much in Canada yet. And I'm not sure why, because so far it seems great. It has a really good insulation value. It's not too flammable. It's all natural. It's so cozy, you just want to kind of make a blanket out of it. Um, it's also not itchy, which we've been working so much with fiberglass and the idea of putting in more of that uh, horrible pink insulation just seems like a terrible idea. It's so itchy. This is nothing like that and even I'm pretty allergic to wool so I was a bit worried but I've had no issues with this so far. We know from the people at Havelock that this is great for van life, um, van builds. Lots and lots of people use it for that. It's so easy to smush into all those little tiny nooks and crannies that both boats and vans have. But what we don't exactly know is how it's going to do with salt water, which as anybody who has a boat knows, knows that that's just a whole different beast and has an amazing ability to break things down. Of course, this will be in our wall, so it shouldn't really matter, but we don't know for sure. So what we're planning to do today is to take it out into the beach. And of course, I've picked a day with extremely low tide, so I have to go find some water. But I'm going to soak this wool in that and then dry it out and see what happens. Right now, it's nice and puffy, it's clean, it's dry, it doesn't have any sort of like sticky, salty 
grainy feel to it at all. So the hope is that once it gets that wet and dries back out again, it'll go back to the state that it started in. We know that wool is really good at being insulative even if it's got 65% of its weight in water. So any damp from condensation, things like that, shouldn't be a problem. And it's meant to help because it actually breathes. So if you think about a couch and sweater or your favorite wool sweater and how great that is in the cold and wet, I mean, we're West Coasters. We know what to do with a wool sweater. We're hoping that putting a whole wool sweater in Luya is gonna give us that same kind of warm insulation that our parents and grandparents had. And yeah, so if if it survives its, its water challenge, then I think we're ready to go ahead and put it into the boat when we insulate in a couple of months. So the beach is just my luck at very low tide. And I will need to go find some water to dump this wool into. In the end, the tide was a little bit too complicated to deal with. So I just got a bucket of water, filled it up with ocean, and brought it back to the boatyard. So I'm gonna dump my wool in, I'm gonna dump the wool in now. And it's kind of interesting, it doesn't really want to submerge. I really have to push it in to even get it to take the water. So it feels like it's quite naturally repellent anyway. But I managed to get it pretty soaked now. It really gains a lot of weight doing that. And I'm just gonna pull it out, push it off. And I'm gonna squeeze a little bit. And then I'm just gonna lay it in the sun and see what happens. All right, so it took a day or two in the sun, but the Havelock wool has completely dried out again and fluffed up nicely, kind of see it. And it's clean, it doesn't feel at all um, salty or sticky, that kind of weird feeling you can get from salt water, it doesn't have that at all. And it also smells amazing, it doesn't have any odor either from the sea or the sheep, so that's really nice. Um, yeah, it's puffed right back up and I think we're really happy with that experiment. So we're gonna definitely be putting it into Luya moving forward. And we're glad to have a really exciting, hopefully super cozy insulation going in. And that's about it for this week's episode. Thank you so much to everybody for following along, liking and subscribing. We love having so many people interested in Luya. And we will be back soon with more of our journey to turn a lifeboat into a liveaboard. In the meantime, have a great day.